praise the Lord. Philippians chapter number one. Oh, we started last week, if you remember, a prayer, a prayer of Paul right here from Philippians chapter number one. And we're going to look at the scripture right after that in just a moment. Did you hear the news? Did you hear the news on uh, Tuesday morning? There's a very famous man who was in a Genesis SUV, and uh, he got in that car, and he was headed to the golf course at 7.30, he was trying to get there by 7.30, named Tiger Woods. And uh, he was going there, must have been running late something, but he was going down a hill, and at the bottom of the hill is a slight curve. He lost control, and that SUV began to tumble, and it went tumbling for approximately 100 feet or so, and it went oh, one over and one over another like this, and then it went into a little bit of a ravine, I guess, and uh, when the people got there to look at it, another person stopped to try to help out. They got rear-ended, and uh, when the people got there to try to get him out there, they, he couldn't get out. He had uh, the legs, his legs were broken, he had the fibula was shattered, and his ankle was shattered, and they had to uh, bust out the windshield, they had to pry him out, and then get him on a, a little uh, pad to put him on, and then carried him out, and then rushed him to the hospital for a long length, I think it was a seven and a half hour surgery, where they began to put a rod and uh, rebuild and reconstruct the bones in his uh, body right there. And uh, there was thoughts, will he ever play golf again? Uh, is it amazing that he survived? And they looked at that with his seatbelt and the, uh, the ability to have those airbags. He did survive, but his life is forever changed. His life is forever changed. Tiger Woods right there. And you could almost hear him asking, why, why did this happen to me? Why did, you can imagine when he woke up on that hospital bed, why did this happen to me? And think about it, he's reliving that thought probably right now, thinking about, boy, you know, things I took for granted. You know, my life is different now. I can't do this. I'm not going to be, will I be able to play golf again? Will I be able to walk again? Uh, why is this happening to me? And uh, today we're going to look at the Apostle Paul who was going through some difficulties and struggles. And the Apostle Paul, remember, what did he do? He went everywhere and preached the gospel. Amen. And uh, he tried to tell everybody about Jesus. And at one point, he got into trouble for it, made somebody mad. And he got thrown into prison, thrown into jail. And he's, in bo he's bound for Christ. He's in bonds. And we begin to look at him. And you, you hear a church right here, the church of Philippi, they're a little bit worried about him. And you can almost hear them, why is this happening to you? And as he's writing this letter to the church at Philippi, he gives a, a phenomenal response about why is this happening to me? Let's stand for the reading of God's word. And we're going to read verses 12, 13, and 14. What we'll do is we'll read all three verses together in unison, all aloud. Uh, Philippians chapter number one, verses 12, 13, and 14. Ready? But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. And, uh, you know, sometimes I think, why is this happening to me? Sometimes it happens to you. You look at a, a situation in your life, you're trying to live for the Lord, you're trying to do right. Why is this happening to me? And the Apostle Paul, he's, uh, bo he's bound for Christ, he's in jail for Christ. And you can almost hear him saying, why did this happen to me? Or you could hear the, the church saying, why is this happening to him? And the Apostle Paul's not worried about it. You understand, he's saying, hey, God is doing this for the furtherance of the gospel and we're going to look at that thought of why did this happen to me. But before we go any further, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. And the Lord, I, I pray for Mr. Tiger Woods. And um, if he's not received the gospel, I pray that somehow you put somebody in his path where he gets the gospel and he gets gloriously saved. And the Lord, sometimes you allow things to happen to get our attention. 
And Lord, I pray that you help them to realize that life is short, but eternity is forever. And then, Lord, in this sermon, I do think there are people here tonight or people watching online. Sometimes I do it. I say those words, why is this happening to me? And I pray that you help me to stop next time I begin to even think that thought and think back to these words that you've given us right here in Philippians chapter number one. And I pray that you help us all to draw closer to you. We love you. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We're going to go through this, uh, but have you ever been there? Have you ever been a time when you were maybe discouraged or you were filled with uh, some anxiety, maybe bothered, scared or troubled? Uh, maybe you're distressed or tried. You could use a lot of different words for it, but you're almost thinking, why did this happen to me? You ever think about that? Can you think of a time when you were just trying to do the will of the Lord and something didn't turn out exactly like you thought? I'd gotten me a car, probably 1998 or 99 time period. And uh, boy, I, the first car that I ever financed, I, I financed $11,000, I remember. And it was a Plymouth Acclaim, oh my. And uh, not long after I uh, had that car, I was driving on Indian River Road. It was stop and go traffic, and it stopped, and I go, and it stopped. And finally, the traffic was going again, and so I started going. I looked to the right, and I went, bam, hit the car right in front of me. The airbag goes off. Ugh. And so the, the car wasn't badly damaged. I remember I went to the junk guard, replaced the steering wheel with a non-airbag steering wheel, and I got the thing back running and on the road. And I remember my pastor, he had his car down in Raleigh, North Carolina, and he needed some help going down there to get it. And so there was another man in our church. We uh, drove down together. We drove uh, down to get his car. We drove all the way down Raleigh, and it was after work one night. And uh, on the way back, I started driving by myself on the highway coming back from North Carolina. And I was going quite fast on the highway, and I remember just I needed to get back. I've got to get to work. You know, I just wanted to help out the preacher. I just wanted to help out my pastor, amen, and I praise God for people doing that. And I remember just starting to sort of doze off a little bit, and I said, I can't stop. I've got to make it. I've got to get back for work. It was a long trip. And I remember as I'm dozing off one time, I remember opening my eyes and running in the back of a truck that was having a trailer, and I hit him hard. And it popped me where I hit forward, I smashed my car. My, remember, the airbag is not on there anymore, so I hit the windshield, and I went and hid my head on the front windshield right there and shattered the windshield right there. And then my car just stopped in the middle of the highway. And you know, I thought, why is this happening to me? Man, was I stupid. And you know, your thoughts begin to rage in your mind. The police came and I got into the police vehicle right there. And then a semi truck, I don't know if he fell asleep, came and all of a sudden we're in the back of that uh, police car on the side of the road and this semi truck swerved and just missed us. Oh my. And I just remember thinking, how can this happen? Why is this happening to me? And what have I done wrong? And look at the, the verse right here in verse number 12. Look at this. But I would, you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto, if you'll say this with me, the furtherance of the gospel. Why, why did this happen to me? Now, I was thinking about this. The Apostle Paul, he's in prison. He's bound, bond, I'm getting that words work mixed up, bound or bond or whatever. You understand he's in prison, right? Amen. And uh, he's in prison for the cause of Christ. And why is this happening to me? Well, first of all, I think it's very, 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 very important to think. Paul was in the will of the Lord. Paul was in the will of the Lord. And I begin to think about this. You know, it's important for us to first and foremost, are we in the will of the Lord? Are we doing what the Lord wants us to do? We should daily look inwardly and make sure we're dead in the center of the will of the Lord. Think about the Apostle Paul. Wherever he was at, maybe Rome, and he begins to go into that city. He sees somebody and says, hey, uh, I need to talk to you. Yeah, yeah, I need to tell you about Jesus. 
Boy, you can see him going to the synagogue and all of a sudden they, they get to that quiet time where he has an opportunity to speak and he gets up and he says, now let me tell you about the Christ who's already come. His name is Jesus. He is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And imagine some of the angst and some of the people that begin to uh, loathe him and despise him. And imagine him going out and about and he just uh, centered on the will of God. And he begins to witness to maybe a Roman soldier. But something happens, uh, an uproar happens. They take him and they throw him into prison. And he's down in the bottom of that prison and uh, it's cold, it's damp, the food's not good. And rather than saying, uh, you know, boy, why did this happen to me? He can look back and say, you know, hey, God allowed this to happen. Why? Because I'm in the center of the will of God. I've been following the Lord, doing the will of God. Hey, where, where he leads, I have followed. What he wants me to do, I have done. And that's vitally important for us. Do you remember the Apostle Paul where it began on that road to Damascus and he was blinded? What did he say? Lord. What wilt thou have me to do? Say that with me. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And I really think that this almost becomes the theme of the Apostle Paul's life. He begins to live. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? If it leads me to prison, so be it. If it leads me to be shipwrecked, so be it. If it leads me to be despised, so be it. If it leads me to Philippi, so be it. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He daily looked for the will of the Lord. Now, really, if you understand this sermon, when we sometimes say, why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to me? It's important, are you in the will of the Lord? Because if you're in the will of the Lord, it's okay. Because if you're in the will of the Lord, it's the will of the Lord. And so look at this. Uh, Look at this verse number 13. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. He said, the furtherance of the gospel. It's happened unto me, the falling out, rather than the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and all other places. Why did this happen to me? And he's able to look at it. Yeah, I'm in the will of the Lord. Obviously, God has me in this prison right now for the furtherance of the gospel. Boy, he's got a plan for me. Boy, why am I despised and rejected similar to Christ? And why why am I being persecuted for the furtherance of the gospel? And the Apostle Paul could be in the bottom of that prison drinking water and having uh, moldy bread right there. And uh, boy, it's dark and it's cold, it's damp. And he begins to think, why is this happening? Well, God's got a plan for the furtherance of the gospel. Hey, I have time down here where I can get a piece of paper and I can write a few letters to churches that need to hear the truth. And right there you can see in one of those prisons that he begins to write some of the uh, Pauline epistles, the prison epistles, you know, for the furtherance of the gospel, the furtherance of the gospel. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 17, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Hey, Paul knew exactly what he was sent for. He knew what he was living for. He knew what his purpose was in life. And he said, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us, 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 That includes you. (laughs) That includes me. Uh, Right? Uh, But in us, which are saved, it is the power of God. You know, his uh, purpose in life is the same purpose we have. You know, we're to live for Christ. And we'll get there in a minute. But uh, you're in the will of the Lord for the furtherance of the gospel. I love Romans chapter 10. You love it too. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He had a heart for the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people to trust Christ as their Savior. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth, to everyone that believeth. Paul lived to get the gospel out to a lost and dying world. It's what he lived for. He knew that that was what the Lord called him to do. When we are in the will of the Lord, when you are in the will of the Lord and I'm in the will of the Lord, we remember that we are here to get out the gospel. And I really want you to think about this. We're here. God has put us here. 
our lives are geared to get out the gospel. This is the purpose of our church. This is the purpose of our lives. Now, when we're living and trying to do God's will for our lives, things don't always go exactly like I would like them to. Though, in reality, uh, I need to turn my likes into his likes. No, his li my likes into what he likes. Yeah, they say I said it right. Amen. I need to be satisfied with God's lot for my life, God's will for my life, whether it is in prison or out of prison. Uh, there's a preacher, Tom Wallace, good man. I think he's 90 years of age now, and he is still going for the Lord. He came to our church here, I don't know, 10 years ago or so and preached for us. And uh, he was so kind to me. He was so kind and uh, wisdom. And he had pastored a church in Maryland, Elkton, Maryland, and the Lord called him to take over and pastor a church in Louisville, Louisville, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And that church grew. And he, he told me, he said, yeah, back in the 70s and early 80s, he said, at that time, we thought the Lord was going to come in the next couple of years. So, you know, a lot of us preachers, we just borrowed as much money as we could possibly borrow uh, because we wouldn't have to pay it back. And uh, he said that. He says, but now I look back and he said, you know, we probably shouldn't have done that. Uh, and, you know, he began to explain how it eventually, the finances caused some issues at the church there. And in a long story short, he became, he no longer pastored that church. And eventually that church, ugh, it, it basically died. It's a very sad story about that church. But, but, you know, he was trying to do the will of the Lord. He's imperfect just like you're imperfect. And he looked back at that as not a failure, but as a stepping stone for the furtherance of the gospel. So then when he went to pastor in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, there was a church that was very divided. And he said, man, God learned some lessons from my past for the furtherance of the gospel. I was able to unite that church. And he now lives on a house that is a part of that church property right there. And, uh, you know, he's a, he's a good man that loves God. But he always looked at it. He didn't look at it as, why did this have to happen to me? He looked at it as, hey, you know, I was in the will of the Lord, trying my best to do the will. Of it didn't work out like I thought, uh, but everything works out for the furtherance of the gospel. You know, in other words, this is, I'm trying to say he didn't have a pity party. He didn't live a life full of anxiety and anger and all of that. In the will of the Lord, uh, you, you, your life may not be going exactly like you think it ought to, but in the will of the Lord, that's where God wants you to be. So concentrate. Here, the whole sermon is about concentrating on being in the will of the Lord. Concentrate on being in the will of the Lord. Why did this happen to me? Look at verse 14. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Amen. He's able to look back and he says, you know, I'm looking at it. I'm in prison now. I'm writing to you from prison. And you know, uh, I'm here for the furtherance of the gospel, but many people can look at what happened to me, that I have a joyous attitude, that I'm still living for the Lord, and all of a sudden it encourages them that they can do the same. Amen. In other words, why did this happen to me? So others will see and be bold. Why did this happen to me? Because God allows you sometimes to go through situations like Job. Like Job. You know, think about all that happened to Job. He lost his health. He lost his wealth. He lost his family. And he said, his wife began to say, why don't you curse God and die? And Job says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Amen. And in the end, we can see how God blessed him. Amen. And when we look back at Job, why did God allow that to happen? Well, so you and I, thousands of years later, can say, well, listen, Job was in the will of the Lord and God took care of him and God will take care of us now. Amen. Everything will be okay. And so why did this happen to me? So others will see and be bold. And Paul knew that a lot of people were watching him. Paul knew that a lot of people are, were watching him and watching how he responded, how he acted. Can I, can I just, you understand where I'm going? You understand that? A lot of people were watching Paul how he responded, how he acted in the face of adversity. And in truth, there's a lot of people watching you. Yeah, you got kids. They're watching you. They're watching you not just at the church house, but they're watching you at home. 
and they're watching how you respond to adversity, how you respond to difficulties in the will of the Lord. And uh, you, uh, Paul could have thrown a fit. Yes, he could have, but others were watching. He could have gotten angry and mad. Yes, but he knew others were watching. He could have thrown in the towel and given up, but others were watching. You know, I'm the pastor of this church. You, you know, you think about pastoring. Everything goes perfect all the time. No, but I also realize that in the will of the Lord, that's okay. And I realize that others are watching. Church members are watching. Well, my family's watching. There's a community out here that sees our church. They're watching. And you understand they're watching. Hey, Dad, uh, I, wanna, I want you to understand your wife is watching you, how you respond, how you act. Your children are watching you, how you respond and your act. Grandpa and Grandma. You know, you're, you're getting up there in age and you don't have the energy you used to. And boy, you have some ailments that you have to go to the doctor for sometimes. And you can begin to say, why is this happening to me? I'll just tell you, you're getting old. That's what happens when you get old. It just happens to everybody. Uh, but listen, how do you act? How do you respond? And it's important to realize that others are watching. Teenagers, holy mackerels. I love our teen choir. They do a phenomenal job. I love hearing them lift up their voices and sing to the glory of God. And you realize, teenagers, others are watching. Well, you say, well, I'm only 13 or 14. Yeah, but others are watching. They're watching how you respond, how you act, and whether you realize it or not. I wish, I, I sometimes wish I would have realized the impact that you have even at a young age. You have an impact at a young age, more than you even know. You impact your brothers and your sisters. You impact the other people that are your age more than you know. Go through a hard time, a difficult time, and respond in a way that glorifies God. Amen. Curtis Hudson, that video we're going to show on Sunday or next Wednesday, uh, saying, I'm on the winning side. And, and that story never grows old to me. He, he's a preacher, and man, he is a preacher that preaches all the time. Revivals, and used mightily in a great way to edit the newspaper, The Sword of the Lord. And at 57, he goes to the doctor and comes out of the doctor, and the doctor says, hey, I need you to come back in the office. Uh, you know, a couple weeks later, I need to talk to you about some things. He goes back there, and all of a sudden he said, well, uh, you got cancer. What do you mean I got cancer? I'm 57. You got cancer. And uh, you better understand that, you know, you're at a stage right now where this is not just a little thing. This is a big deal. You're in truth. I, you know, I got to tell you, this is serious. You, you don't have much longer to live. We can try to do this and this, but just be frank with you. You better get everything in order. You don't have much time. And imagine that. And, and how did he respond? How did he act in the will of the Lord? He's in the will of the Lord. But you know, you, you could have spent the last two years of life whining and complaining and in anger and malice, but, but that's not what he did. He had joy. He knew his son was watching him, who's now a pastor in Tennessee. He knew his wife was watching him. He knew that others was watching him. I had just gotten saved in 1994. He was at the end of his life, and I heard that song sung, I'm on the winning side. And then I remember the, going to a conference right after he died that he lived for God, and boy, uh, his life was an encouragement to me right then when I first got saved. And, and you know, he knew others were watching. He didn't know that he was going to influence me, but he did. And he influenced so many people. And you, when you go through those difficult times in the will of the Lord, Hey, listen, people are watching. People are watching. Why did this happen to me? Look at this, verse 15. And these are the next few verses. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the, the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. Yeah, I lost you all. You know, you look down, but you really weren't reading. Christ is preached. So uh, when I get that preach, just say preach. Christ is preached. That's better. And therein do I rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. And, and what are you saying? Why did this happen to me? In the end, so Christ will be preached. I know it's for the furtherance of the gospel, but in the end, there were tangible results. Christ was preached. 
Christ was preached. He was in prison, and because of he, he being in prison, Christ worked it out that the gospel was spread even farther and greater. Amen. When you're in the will of God, when you're a dead sinner in the will of God, Christ is preached. It, it just happens. When you're in the will, when a church is in the will of God, what, what is a church here for? To preach the gospel to every creature, to baptize them, to teach them all, to observe all things whatsoever I command you. That's what a church is here for. So when a church is in the will of God, Christ is preached. Does it mean that there's not going to be hard times at the church? Of course it's going to be hard times, but that's okay. Amen. Why? Because God's will is okay. Even hard times are okay, and Christ will be preached, and it's okay. We can have a smile on our face. We can have joy. We can be on our knees sometimes and saying, hey, Lord, please help me. We don't know how it's all going to work out, but we trust you and believe in you. But in the end, being in the will of God, Christ has always been preached. Being in the will of God, Christ will always be preached. Why? Because that is the will of the Lord. It's important. And... Uh, Paul was saying, hey, watch me. And when you watch me in prison right here, the end result of that, hey, more, more of the gospel is getting preached. And, you know, I've meant, mentioned John Reynolds. You know, John Reynolds is a great man. I, 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 I really want, you're here on Wednesday night anyways. I, I'm just begging you and probably you folks online, hey, I want you to come too. And uh, I want everybody in all of Tidewater and Hampton Roads to come to this because they've got a great man of God coming. A great man of God. Uh, John Reynolds uh, really was the right-hand man of Curtis Hudson from the time he pastored in Forest Hills Baptist Church in, outside Atlanta to the time that Curtis Hudson went in street, uh, into, not street evangelism, but evangelism and editor. Wherever Curtis Hudson went, John Reynolds went as his right-hand man helping him. When Curtis Hudson got sick with cancer, John Reynolds became basically the editor of the Sword of the Lord for three years. When Curtis Hudson died, it was a natural thing for John Reynolds to become the editor of the Sword of the Lord. It was just what's going to happen. But it didn't. And there was a divide among uh, Baptists, who should be the next editor. And the divide, they just didn't want him to be. And you can imagine his personally, he, he believed the Lord had called him to serve until he died. Curtis Hudson is dead. Now, what am I going to do? Am I going to go have a pity party? John Reynolds had no pity party. He was in the will of God. He said, obviously, God, you closed this door. It's not for me to get mad about or angry about or complain about. It's a meaning that you're going to open the door somewhere else for the furtherance of the gospel so Christ will be preached. And so what it did is he allowed him to go start a church. And he went and started a church in Florida, and it grew from just a handful of people to over 1,000 before he retired from there in a couple years ago. And that's where I, I met him. I met him, and out of that church, he, he would go, and uh, it's so funny, he would go start other churches. He started like six or seven other churches where he started them. He's the pastor of that big church, and he would go and take a, a weekend, and he'd go start a church where he'd go preach in another city in a hotel room, and he started churches. It's crazy. And he encouraged us to start churches. The, the point being is rather than have a pity party, he just kept going, and it influenced me. Do you understand that? And your, your point is when you uh, go through a difficult time and you, you stay close to the Lord, you realize you're in the will of the Lord, Christ will be preached. Your children will see it and will grow up to serve God rather than turn away from the Lord. Hey, your church members will see Christ in you and they say, hey, look at uh, things. He's in the will of the Lord going through some difficulties, but he's got joy. He's got love. He's long suffering. He's kind. And all of a sudden they'll look at that and they'll say, hey, Boy, I want to be closer to Christ. I'll preach Christ. Look at this one. Look at verse number 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified. I love that thought right there. Why did this happen to me? So Christ will be magnified. So Christ will be magnified. Uh, boy, Christ, you, you know how it is. You're getting older. I, I forgot today I'd put on my reading glasses and I'm reading. And then all of a sudden I, I looked over at my phone and I said, man, the, the screen is so big. And then all of a sudden I realized I had my reading glasses on. You know, they're magnifying glasses. 
And uh, you, you think about it, when you are in the will of the Lord, you got that joy and you got that, uh, that happiness and all of a sudden Christ is magnified. You're magnifying Christ in your life. That's an amen. That is an amen, amen, amen. Because it's all about Christ. It's all about Christ. Ha, ah, I, I, I think about it. You know, there, there is a man, and this is a miracle. And I, I was on the phone with Chris Faulkner a week and a half ago. We were reliving our trip to Sardinia two years ago in February. And uh, we were talking about how we came home. And he says, you know, I'd look back. And if I would recommend to, if I heard of a, a family doing what I was going to do, I'd recommend them not doing that at that time because what they're doing is crazy. But he says, I look back and he said, look what the Lord's done. Because it's a miracle. You know, the, the support and everything. And I remember there was a time when we were trying to figure out how to get them there quickly. But, you know, it boils down to it costs money. It just costs money. And what, the only way for it to work out was the Lord due to a miracle. And I remember talking to a certain man, and he says, you know what, I know somebody, and uh, this man is looking for a missionary in a church that'll send him out, and might be willing to give toward this. And uh, he said, I don't want to mention his name, he doesn't like anybody knowing about it at all, and uh, you know what, and to make a long story, sh a long story short, he gave $24,000 to Brother Chris Faulkner and getting him over there that year, and then last year, he gave another uh, $24,000, $36,000, $36, $36, yeah, $36,000. And then he, he wrote a check for $24,000 at the end of last year to help him out. You know what, though? In the end, looking back, me and Brother Chris said, look what the Lord's done. In the will of the Lord, look what he's done. And God has done great things, great things, great things. Hey, Why? Why did this happen so Christ will be magnified? This is the last one. Why did this happen to me? Look at verse 21. For me to live, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For me, you can almost see it. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Why did this happen to me? And I, I don't know if I worded this very good. I tried to. Why did this happen to me? Because I know in the will of God my life is all about Christ and what he wants. Amen. That's what he's saying. Because, in the, uh, it, because I know in the will of God, I know in the will of God, when I do the will of God, I'm living for Christ. It's all about Christ and what he wants. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You can almost see Paul being down in that prison with a smile on his face. By the way, that happened before in Philippi, had it not? He got beat, whipped, thrown in the jail. And what's he doing? And at midnight, he's singing praises to God glorifying God. He'd seen it before and at midnight that began to have that earthquake before and he's able to look back and say, you know, God did it there. He's doing it again here. I may not always see the results right away, but it doesn't matter. I've lived long enough to be in the will of God to see that God always takes care of it. Always takes care of it. And by the way, he does. He always does. God always takes care of it. When you're in the will of God, God always takes care of it. It's glorious. It's wonderful. Here's the thought. Let us daily, let us, us, you and me, moi, Paris, Philippi, right? You guys are just chandala, something like that. Uh, let us daily make sure that we're walking in the Spirit, daily doing the will of the Lord. Let, let us daily, not, not, it's not a one-time decision in your life. I'm going to do the will of the Lord and settle. No, it's daily. Apostle Paul said, I die daily. What he's saying is I have to put to, 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 to death my flesh, my wicked, rotten flesh daily. I die daily. So let us daily make sure that we're walking in the Spirit and in the will of the Lord. Number two, let us daily remember that the gospel needs to be preached. Let us daily remember. Let's remember that the gospel needs to be preached. Church, we need to preach the gospel. Amen. Uh, at home, it's so important for us to preach the gospel. It's so, can I just say it's important for us to be Christians? Amen. It's important. It's important. I, I don't, I don't, do I, very, do I don't really chastise our church very often, do I? I don't, I don't, I don't, okay. If I told my children to do their schoolwork, 
Okay? I expect them to do the schoolwork. Okay? But then if I don't check up on it, and they didn't do the schoolwork, and I found out they didn't schoolwork, it disappoints me. Does it disappoint you? Yeah, it would disappoint you. Why didn't you do your schoolwork? And, you know, as a dad, I would say, kid, <laughs> you didn't do it. You're going to do your schoolwork. Okay? So listen, I'm going to give you an example. We, we're Christians, okay? We have missionaries. And, and we, we'll amen saying it's not all about the money. But you give, you give. But, but we're terrible if we don't pray for them. We're terrible if we can't pray for them. And then if your pastor asks you, begs you, pleads with you, begs a church that had over 200 and we probably had 30 people here on Sunday, 230, and we have four people that fill in a little thing to our missionary for Brother Galleon after I told him we're going to have a bunch of people who'll send you a nice message this week. That, 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 I'm not chastising you. I'm just saying that's sad. That's sad. We go a little bit further, we talk about preaching the gospel. Well, amen, preaching the gospel, but, but my goodness, we better carry some gospel tracks. Yeah. We ought to invite somebody to a revival we're having. Yeah. We ought to be excited about it a little bit. Yeah. Amen? Why? Because that's what Christians do. Yeah. And it's not being mean, I'm just telling you the truth. And you know, when we, we have an opportunity to take 10 seconds and fill out a little form. Pray for your missionary and fill out a little form right there. You don't realize the impact you have on that missionary that he has a, a church praying for them and cares for them. And here is, by the way, I'm, I'm not going to go long on this. But listen, say, well, pastor, I don't understand how that works. You figured out how to file your taxes. Why? Money. Right? So if you can figure out how to file your taxes, you can feel out how to push that button right there and fill it out. Now that's the meanest I get tonight. <laughs> can I beg and plead with you to pray for your missionaries and send them a little thing? Why do we gotta end on a bad note? Let us daily make sure we're walking in the spirit, doing the will of the Lord. Let us daily remember that the gospel needs to be preached, church, home, and out and about. By the way, it'll make you feel better if you go home and you fill that out. Then when I say it next week, you'll feel all good. You know, it'll be okay. And so rather than getting mad at the preacher for saying that, just fill out the form, pray for the missionary, and it'll be okay. Amen? We can do that right there. Just nod your head. You can do that. It'll solve everything. It's like my kid. He'll get mad at me for saying you should do your homework. And they'll say, well, what? Because I said so. That's why. And so it's good for you. You need to do, this, do the homework, okay? Uh, let us daily remember that living right, doing right, magnifies the Lord to others around us. Amen. Now, almost finished. Let us daily remember that being in the will of God, whatever happens, my life is all about Christ and what he wants. You, do you remember in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 15, you read Exodus chapter 15, God delivered them from the Egyptians. Do you ever remember Exodus 15, the song that they sing? And it's a glorious song about how great my God is. He brought me victory. He defeated the Egyptians. He did this. It's a glorious song. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Some of you. Okay, most of you do. It's a beautiful song in the scriptures. Okay. But not long after that, they forget. They forget. Numbers chapter uh, 21. The soul of the people was much discouraged because of the people... The Bible says, and the people spake against God and against Moses. And it's easy for us to all of a sudden go through a difficult time. And rather than trust that God's going to work everything out, God's going to be magnified through this. We're just in the will of the Lord. He's allowing us to go through this, to be discouraged and complain. When we do that, when we complain, think, think about the Apostle Paul. If you could just think for a second. What if the Apostle Paul got in that prison and began to complain? God, why? This makes no sense. I don't care if all these other prisoners know about it. Bless God, I was just doing the will of the Lord. And now look at my back. Look at this. Now look at Barnabas. He's right here. Silas, he's right here with me. We're in prison. I told him to follow me and everything would be all right. This is pitiful, Lord. 
Can you imagine? Think, think about all the miracles that would have been missed out. I mean, the, 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 the whole New Testament would have changed. But think about your life, that difficulty that you've been going through or about to go through, and when you have that anger or that attitude, you're, you're hindering the future and the gospel's not going to be preached. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. And I don't think any of us want to be a hindrance to other people. We want to be in your will. Our spirit indeed is willing, but our flesh is weak. But help us to be reminded that being in your will makes a difference. When, when we're talking about the gospel, Lord, we're talking about people being saved. They're no longer going to be bound for hell, but they're going to be in heaven. And help us to remember when we have that attitude and we are justified for having an attitude, all of a sudden there's no justification and there's no consequences for that. Lord, help us to, desire, to, to realize that the next time we go through that trouble and we're in your will, to have simple childlike faith that you're going to work it out. Then, Lord, I did talk about maybe a delicate thing about emailing our missionaries. And Lord, I, I pray that rather than somebody getting mad about me mentioning that, it would inspire our church to realize that we can make a difference by encouraging our missionaries. We're encouraging them to get the gospel out. And Lord, I pray that you help us to have a, a rally of people go and, and try to pray for our missionaries, but also contact them and let them know that they're praying. Lord, I pray that you be with our church. We're about to have a revival. And Lord, in order to have a revival, that needs to start really with the individual, all of us searching our hearts and our minds and really making sure that we are dead center in your will. I pray that you bless in Jesus' name. Amen.